If you play games anything like the way we do, then you're constantly trying to break them, to get to places you're not supposed to be, or to skip entire sections through clever workarounds or things you're not supposed to know. Uh, old habits die hard. Damn it, that usually works. What's even more satisfying than finding something you're not supposed to do, or even shouldn't do, however, is finding that the game developers also predicted that you were going to do it and prepared a response for you. They're always one step ahead. Please enjoy these seven times game developers predicted your nonsense and beware spoilers ahead for the following games. Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. This was not the correct way to the meeting room, and Stanley knew it perfectly well. The king of games that have predicted every single thing you could possibly do is, of course, the Stanley Parable, which has a narrator so omniscient I sometimes have to check behind me to make sure he isn't back there watching me play. At this point, Stanley's obsession with this room bordered on creepy and reflected poorly on his overall personality. I imagine it's a thousand times worse if your name is actually Stanley. You might think, however, that there's no way this all-knowing narrator can predict every possible thing I'm going to do. I'm a human being with free will and complex impulses, and he's just a load of recorded voice lines. I bet there's some way I can do something he can't predict. To which I say, you're welcome to try. Maybe you're thinking that by breaking the game somehow, you'll finally stump old Mr. Talks a lot back there. Perhaps there's a way to glitch out of the map. Surely they won't have predicted you'd try to do that. Ha <laughs> ha! Silence! I broke the map. At first, Stanley assumed he'd broken the map, until he heard this narration and realised it was part of the game's design all along. Ah. Yes, the Stanley Parable knew you would try and do this as well, and this is technically one of the game's dozens of endings, with you standing in a featureless white void. So, now that you're here, what do you think? Isn't this a fun and unique place to be? And the narrator asking you if you're sick of it yet and want to restart. OK, I'm over it now. What do you think? Are you sick of this gag yet? This is an impasse that, to be honest with you, I don't think you're going to win. There once was a man named Stanley, who people considered so manly. Damn, he's good. Would you rather fight a hundred chicken-sized zombies or ten zombie-sized chickens? Just to be clear, you wouldn't have any weapons or armor. That's easy. I'll take the little, tiny, little zombies. A hundred of them, crawling all over you with their tiny hands. Uh, all I need is, like, a shovel. Uh, I'm telling you, way too easy. One of the key reasons Minecraft has been so successful is it's about total freedom. The opportunity to go wherever you like and build whatever you want. Yes, even one of those. Narrative spin-off game series, Minecraft Story Mode, on the other hand, is almost the exact opposite. It's about telling a mostly linear story, where the only real choices are how unnecessarily rude you'd like to be to your group of companions. Sorry, Lucas. I only have four. Oh, no. It's... it's alright. I'm not that hungry anyway. I'll just... grab something in the morning, or... something. You were so busy building, you forgot to build the most important thing of all. A netherite sword. No wait, a relationship. With so much of the events of Minecraft story mode outside of your control, you could be forgiven for attempting to express yourself creatively with the small opportunities you have. Like in episode 2, when Petra gives you the ingredients to build a stone sword at a crafting table. One stick plus two stones equals one sword. It also equals broken bones, if I remember the schoolyard rhyme correctly. In spite of this game's focus on story, the crafting table in Minecraft story mode functions just like the one in Minecraft proper. And if you know your Minecraft recipes, you have a brief, shining moment to break the rules and build something entirely different. Yes, the stick and two blocks of stone can also be used to create a lever. 
something the developers knew you'd try, and they even offer up an achievement called leveraging resources to acknowledge your tomfoolery. Petra doesn't sound quite so impressed though, and gives you the resources to do it again properly and progress the story. See? Isn't it better when you make it yourself? You'll then spend the rest of the game carrying around a seemingly useless lever. But in another developer nod to your ingenuity slash idiocy, in episode 4 when the time comes for you to use a lever to open a secret passageway in Ivor's cottage, you've already got the lever handy. There's even a bit of unique dialogue for that eventuality, to remind you of that one opportunity you had to build something unique in Minecraft story mode. We probably just need a lever to power it. Well, it's a good thing I still have one. From like, ages ago. Still yet to find a way to construct a giant though. The search continues. Nine months ago, Joker was cremated. I pressed the button and burnt the evil bastard myself. And then, we waited. Gotham braced itself for the inevitable power struggle. But it didn't come. Crime actually fell. Deep down, I knew war was coming. I was just waiting for someone to pull the trigger. At the start of Batman Arkham Knight, you don't play as Batman trying to save Gotham, but rather a GCPD cop called Officer Owens, who has a similarly important mission, trying to eat waffles and bacon without his wife finding out. No, you know what? Make it waffles. With a side of bacon. Don't tell my wife. Whatever you say, officer. But it's not long until this scene takes a turn for the supernatural as the diner's customers are replaced with terrifying zombie-like creatures, Officer Owens draws his gun, and the game briefly becomes a first-person shooter as you try to take down as many of the monsters as you can. It's later revealed that this whole sequence of events was the result of Scarecrow's fear toxin. The monsters were a hallucination, and the people you shot were just that, regular people. As such, when you encounter Officer Owens later on in a lockup in the Gotham City Police Department, he is distraught, and his colleagues are shocked and appalled. He ain't gonna be able to live with himself when he finds out what he did in that diner. He's gonna lose his badge for sure. Owens is a good cop, lives for the job. He don't deserve this. So maybe you see this and you think to yourself, haha, I'll just play through again and not shoot anyone. Then the dialogue will be all wrong. That'll show Arkham Knight who's boss. Well, guess again, because Arkham Knight has anticipated your every move, and if you go through the sequence without shooting anyone, the dialogue in the police station is completely different. God knows how we got out without shooting anyone. The people in that diner tore each other apart. All right, Arkham Knight, you win this round. All right, uh, Elias has... Stop, fellow! Stab Fellow has vanished into the darkness beyond the tower door. The only sign of him is his blood trail. But as you watch, the flagstones seem to drink in the blood, the cracks glistening red. Oh, Jesus Christ on a stick, Abigail. Don't be such a baby. We either head through the door. Oh, forget that, it just ate our warrior. Prey is set in an alternate timeline in which JFK wasn't assassinated, which has made some pretty big changes to the world. For example, people now live in beautiful Art Deco space cities and also get regularly murdered by shadow monsters. Kind of a good news, bad news situation. One thing that has remained consistent, however, is the popularity of Dungeons and Dragons, as seen in the side quest Treasure Hunt, in which your character Morgan Yu has to find four treasure maps given by Abigail Foy to her Talos One role-playing group. Each of the maps that you find helps you deduce one of the numbers of a four-digit code that will unlock a prize for you in Abigail's room. However, the code is the same every time you play, so what's to stop you from looking it up online and skipping the entire quest? Well, it turns out that Prey developers Arcane Studios know exactly what you're like and programmed in a contingency for this exact situation. If you're playing fair and square and complete the quest properly, your reward is a chipset for Morgan's suit called the Adventurer's Toolkit. This increases your recycler yield, gives you a higher critical hit chance with the wrench, a more efficient flashlight, and faster movement speed when crawling through tight spaces. Or, as Angela puts it in the description, everything you need for a successful dungeon excursion. Turns out people who play Dungeons & Dragons haven't changed either. 
But if you try to enter the correct combination before you're supposed to know it, Prey will know that you haven't acquired it by legitimate means, and as such, there's a different prize waiting for you in Abigail's room. Instead of the Adventurer's Toolkit, you receive the decidedly less good Game Master's Ire, a chipset that essentially does the exact opposite, reducing your recycler yield, nerfing your flashlight, and making you slower at crawling through gaps. Oh, and it's permanent! That's what you get for not listening to your DM. If I get you out of here, will you still take me up to the head? Yes, equip before him. Whoa! <laughs> Psychonauts 2 sees you as professional mental adventurer Raz jumping into people's brainscapes to muck around with their mind. Only, you know, nicer than that sounds. These brainscapes are all unique to the individual and include such wild and wonderful settings as a casino, a psychedelic rock concert, and a cooking show hosted by goat puppets. You know, normal stuff. See if the judges can bear too. <laughs> While it might seem like anything goes in these mental mazes, there is one thing that Psychonauts 2 won't abide, and that's your dirty mouth, video game players. You can see this in the level Cruller's Correspondence, which is set in an enormous mail sorting room. At one point, you need to use a massive typewriter to address a letter, which you do by pounding out the name of the recipient on the typewriter's gigantic keys. Oh, that's right. That's the name we all forgot. However, Psychonauts 2 knows what you're like, and so if you try to write any kind of swear word, not only will the game censor it, but you'll also receive a dressing down from Ford Cruller, the person whose mind you're currently in. <laughs> Impressive, but you haven't reckoned with my extensive vocabulary of rude words, Psychonauts. That's a possibility. Checkmate, developers. <laughs> This may come as a surprise to those of you who haven't seen it in action, but 2014's Goat Simulator from Coffee Stain Studios isn't actually a realistic simulator of life as a goat. If you have seen it in action, you were probably tipped off by all the explosions and ostriches driving cars, and also goats in space. I mean, I assume this is unrealistic. I don't actually know any goats. This was, in fact, a big part of the appeal of Goat Simulator, the fact that it was totally bonkers, unhinged carnage all the time. The game gave you a big sandbox full of stuff to smash into, blow up, and, uh, lick, and the developers absolutely knew that everyone who played the game would be trying to do as much as possible to break the game in various hilarious ways. So much so that the developers added an achievement to Goat Simulator called Involuntary QA, which you get for crashing the game. QA, or Quality Assurance, is the department of a game development studio that deals with testing the games to make sure they run properly and don't crash, and who presumably all got let go the day Coffee Stain Studios realised that there was just no way they were ever going to exhaustively test a game that allows you to headbutt a train until it explodes. So they just make crashing the game an achievement instead. Bet you wish you'd thought of that, other game developers. No way. This just keeps getting worse. Much has already been made of the fact that the Resident Evil 4 remake allows you to skip the opening village fight, which normally ends when the church bell sounds, by simply shooting the bell yourself. Can't believe we didn't think of that before. La campana. I'll give you the However, Resident Evil 4 is also a game that lets you unlock a rocket launcher with unlimited ammo. And having been in the game dev biz for a while now, Capcom knew that with that kind of firepower, players were going to be finding ways to exploit it. That's why the Resident Evil 4 remake contains a massive number of rocket-related shortcuts in areas where you'd normally never have access to highly powerful explosives. These not only make the game a lot quicker, but were clearly anticipated by the developers themselves in that stuff that looks like it should be blow-uppable 
is blow up a ball. For example, at this point in the game, down in the mines, your path is blocked by a load of debris and you need to retrieve some TNT from deeper in the mine in order to clear it. Of course, this shouldn't be an issue if you have an infinite rocket launcher. And clearly, Capcom agrees, because the game allows you to just blow the barricade apart and carry on on your merry way without having to do the whole dynamite bit. How about this bit in the castle, where you're trying to get the goat head item and a guy pulls a lever and lowers you down into a room full of enemies? Not if you've got a rocket launcher! You can even use the rocket launcher to significantly weaken the wall that actually usually takes ages to destroy with a wrecking ball. And the game never tries to stop you, even if it does somewhat undermine the final boss fight, in which usually you have to wait until Ada throws you a rocket launcher. Use this. Not a problem when you brought your own. Man, maybe bring an infinite rocket launcher instead of a pistol on your next mission, Leon? Just saying. Thanks so much for watching this video about games that predicted your nonsense. Exactly, they knew exactly what you were going to do. They got you, they got you down to a T, mate. They know exactly what you're up to. And I know the same about you. I've been studying you. And I reckon you're going to click on one of these two videos. Uh, either up here, this is a nice video from us, or down here is one from Outside Extra. And don't think about trying to prove me wrong by going to watch Mr. Beast or someone. Because I, I know you're going to do it. Please do it. Please. Thank you.